everyone. Welcome to the tutorial, Harnessing the Power of UVM for Analog Mixed Signal Verification with XModel. I'm Jae Kim with Scientific Analog, and this is a recording of the tutorial we gave at DVCon US 2023. Let me begin with a motivation of this tutorial. Basically, we like to extend UVM to Analog Mixed Signal Verification. This UVM, which stands for Universal Verification Methodology, is a framework of building various reusable, scalable test benches with using standardized components. This UVM framework has been largely successful for building test benches for digital systems. And we'd like to extend this to analog circuits as well. The question is why? Um, there could be many reasons, but one key reason I can cite is that we now see many analog circuits having digital programmability. In other words, analog circuits not only have analog inputs and outputs, but they can take various digital inputs, for example, to control some of the characteristics of the analog circuits or even change the functionality of the analog circuits. And to fully verify uh, a circuit that contains both the analog feature and digital feature, uh, we like to use uh, the ABM like, uh, sorry, UVM like verification approaches. And let me tell you the key message of this tutorial right away. Extending UVM to analog mixed signal verification is not hard. In fact, we can do so using the standard UVM components available today, as long as we can have a well-defined fixture module satisfying these two conditions. First condition is that this fixture module has to include the analog circuit model uh, under verification, obviously. And for this tutorial, we like this model to be described in system Verilog so that the model and the UVM test bench uh, uh, enclosing the model can be entirely run in system Verilog. And second, the, the second requirement is that to utilize the standard UVM components, we'll also like to include some analog instrumentation inside this fixture module, which can generate the stimulus and also measure the response of this analog circuit model. This way, the information crossing the boundary of fixture module can be simple parameter values, uh, not, not the analog waveforms themselves. For example, uh, from the UVN test bench, uh, we can take in the value of the frequency and the stimulus generator inside the fixture module can generate the actual analog waveform uh, using that, that information. For example, generating a sinusoid with that frequency. Similarly, at the output, we don't want to you know, take the analog waveform all the way to the UVM test bench. Instead, we take measurements on that analog waveform using another instrumentation. For example, uh, it can measure the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude value of the output response and, and, and propagate that value to the UVM test bench. So, if we have a fixture module with the analog circuit model in system Verilog and this and the analog instrumentation blocks that can either do a uh, stimulus generation or a response measurement, then we can have a UVM test bench performing AMS verification. Here's the outline of this tutorial. Throughout the tutorial, you'll learn how to write UVM test benches for AMS circuits. And in part one, uh, we'll start with a brief introduction to XModel and go through some exercise examples on writing AMS instrumentation using the XModel primitives. For the analog circuit model, we will learn how to use a tool called ModelZen to auto-extract system Verilog model from the existing analog circuits. Now with these two components, we can complete a fixture module and we'll do that uh, for, for a 
an example of a bandpass filter. And in part two, we'll, we'll learn how to put together the UVM components like sequencer, driver, monitor, and scoreboard uh, to compose a UVM test bench that performs various analog simulation on this fixture. Here's the information about, about ourselves. Um, I'm Jae-ha Kim, again, uh, currently a professor at Seoul National University in Korea. And I'm also a CEO and founder of Scientific Analog, which develops X model. Although I write a lot of codes these days, um, I still consider myself as an analog circuit designer. And I'll focus on this first part, uh, describing the fixture module enclosing the analog circuits. The part two, which is on building a uh, UVM test bench on top of this fixture module, will be covered by my colleagues, Charles Danchak. And he is a, currently a verification instructor and consultant at Battlesoft Consulting. And he's a veteran uh, and, and, and system Verilog as he's been teaching system Verilog at UCSD Extension uh, since 2007. He's an also, he's an also, uh, he, He's also the author of a paper on, on UVM test bench for AMS verification. And in fact, the key message, key message that I just mentioned is drawn from his paper. All right, so let me start with part one, building a fixture module for AMS circuit. Here's a brief introduction to X model. X model is a plugin, we can call it add-on to the existing system Verilog, like Excelium of, from Cadence, BCS from Synopsys, or Quest of, of, uh, from Siemens. And it enables very fast and accurate analog mixed signal simulation entirely in system Verilog. It has a very unique but powerful event-driven algorithm that can deliver much faster speed compared to real number model without sacrificing accuracy. And when it comes to modeling analog, it can model analog circuits both as a functional model and also as a circuit level model. So it gives you full flexibility in describing your analog circuits. And everything runs in system Verilog uh, without requiring code simulation. Um, in other words, it is fully compliant with the system Verilog-based flows. So it's an ideal solution for doing this uh, UVM simulation on top of analog circuits. How does X model work? Um, it starts with a question of how do we extend the Verilog's event-driven algorithm to simulating analog circuits? As you know, Verilog is extremely efficient at simulating a very large, complex digital circuit. And key, key to that uh, uh, efficiency or scalability is the fact that Verilog only processes the parts that experiences events. For example, if some signal, some if a digital signal changes from zero to one, only the parts that receive that change will be examined and computed. If it, and if it causes a change that it outputs, now those changes will propagate to the next block and only those parts will be processed. So even when your system is really big, uh, you only process, uh, you only do the computation at, in parts uh, and that is the main key to its uh, scalability. But for analog, extending this concept doesn't seem that straightforward because even for a simple analog circuit, like this RC low pass filter, and when it receives a simple change in its input, like a step change shown here, the output may not be a simple chain. For instance, its output can be a continuous waveform changing from one value to the other through a exponential decaying function. And oftentimes, people use a set of points here uh, to, to express that waveform which triggers not one, but a series of events. And that's the basic problem with the most of the animal simulators out there, like SPICE, Verilog AMS, real number model, 
they use all use the same approaches of expressing an analog waveform using a set of points. And in system Verilog, each value, each point over here will require a event trigger, event, uh, an event to be triggered. Uh, and the more event you have to trigger, the slower the simulation becomes. X model uses a different approach expressing the same analog waveform. And the first goal is to reduce the number of events required to express the waveform. To do that, each event uh, not just indicates the value at, at the particular point, but it, it indicates the equation uh, describing how that waveform will change uh, after that event time. And it, it will only trigger new events when that equation has to change. The particular equation form that we assume is shown in the slide, uh, which is basically a sum of exponential uh, with, with the optional t to the n factor in front of it. Some of you may recognize that this is the equation, this is expression for a general solution of a linear dynamical system. And because of that, that time domain expression can be easily converted into a Laplace domain. And once your signal is expressed in Laplace domain, you can do a very easy computation to get the response of a given analog circuit. That is, you take the input Laplace domain expression and multiply that with the Laplace domain transfer function of your circuit. Then you get the Laplace domain expression for the output, uh, which has the same form that we assumed before, which can be converted back to the time domain expression. And the key point here is that I only need to do this computation once when the input expression changes. In other words, you update the output equation only when the input equation is updated. And this is what we call purely event-driven simulation. So here's an example waveform. Uh, that you can see uh, the benefits of event-driven simulation X model. Um, the top waveform is a uh, some uh, uh, the waveform of ones and zero, the digital waveform, gen uh, driven by a some transmitter. Now that waveform is going through a lossy channel. You can think of it as analog filter, producing this second uh, analog waveform. Now it goes through another filter, uh, which can model a, a circuit called equalizer, producing another uh, analog filter, uh, sorry, analog signal. Now these markers on, on the waveform indicate where the events are being triggered during the system Verilog simulation. And notice that the events on the waveforms are being triggered only when the corresponding input has an event. and there's no event in between. Still, uh, by using the equation that I described before, which is, con which is uh, contained by each of the event, uh, you, can, you can still fully describe what's happening between the two events, and therefore we don't lose any accuracy. And, 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 and because the number of events are so few, the simulation will be very fast. Uh, Well, um, and but for for most of the people, uh, dealing with Laplace domain expression directly is hard. So to make things easy for you, X model provides a set of building blocks that we call primitives. And to to build models, all you have to do is to build put together these uh, primitive building blocks. Right now, we have two hundred twenty primitives in seven different categories. And they are very rich to describe various functionality of analog circuits. Let me walk you through some of the primitives we have. The first category is called domain translator. And these primitives can take a clock and extract some characteristics out of that clock. For example, a delay, duty cycle, frequency, phase, and so on. It can also do the opposite thing like taking the characteristics as the input signal and produce a clock with that characteristics. 
for example, frequency to clock primitive, take a frequency in and generate a clock with that frequency. So these primitives are very useful uh, when modeling various timing circuits like oscillators, delay line, duty cycle adjusters, and so on. The second category of primitives called stimulus generators. And these can either generate analog stimuli, digital stimuli, and even replay waveform from the previous simulation. Third class is called logic gate primitive, and they represent some of the logic gate that, are, that you are uh, familiar with, like inverter, NAND gate, latch, key flip-flop, and so on. But don't take me wrong uh, that we are not trying to we are not trying to replace Verilog for modeling digital circuits. So these uh, logic gate primitives are not for a normal digital logic. They are for modeling some special digital gates whose timing must be uh, simulated in an accurate manner. For example, uh, the best, best example is a phase frequency detector using a phase, phase lock loop, uh, where the circuit is comparing the phase differences of the two input clocks and produce that result using a pulse width of its output. So in some sense, the, the circuit has a form of a digital circuit, but really processing analog values. So for those special digital gates, uh, you really want to have an infinite resolution in, in, in expressing their timing. And these primitives are capable of doing that. In other words, the timing of the digital signals are not limited to the time resolution of the system variable. The fourth uh, primitive category is the connect primitive. And these uh, primitives convert types of the signal, for example, from analog to digital, digital to analog, um, and, and, and our special data type like X-real, X-bit, to more traditional data type, real and wire. The next prim primitive category is the measurement primitive. Uh, these can measure various property of the analog signals or even digital signals. Uh, for example, rise time, fall time, delay, average, peak to peak amplitude, and so on. And these are good for um, taking the measurements and writing uh, automatic assertion checks within your test bench. We, we have a set of primitives describing the various elements in analog circuits, like ideal sources, device elements, including the register capacitor, transistors, some nonlinear elements and variable elements, uh, as well as uh, you know, probing the voltage or current or initializing the voltage and current. Lastly, but not the least, we have a lot of primitives for describing the functions of analog circuits, starting with basic, basic one like add, multiply, scaling, uh, but also uh, nonlinear functions, um, and, and, and uh, those that model the linear dynamical systems like filter, integration, derivative, uh, the primitives doing the data conversion between analog and digital, and also doing various other things like sampling, delaying, selections, etc. Since composing a model with X model is just to put together these primitives together, you can in fact do that in a schematic form. So Glister is a graphical user environment uh, that lets you describe your analog models in this schematic form uh, in the tools like Cadence Virtuoso or Synopsys Custom Compiler. Here's a snapshot of that flow. Here's a Cadence uh, schematic editor, and these little blocks are the symbols for the X model primitive. So you place them on the schematic and connect them up using wires. And you can netlist that schematic into a system Verilog code. Okay. And then uh, based on your preference, you can simulate uh, within Cadence Virtual. So 
uh, and 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 plot the waveform inside, or you can you can run the simulation on the command line. All right, so this tutorial uh, is contains the uh, various lab exercises, and you can you can do it yourself uh, while listening to this recording. So you you can download this package uh, called uvm underscore x model uh, 2023.03.tar.zz. And at first, so here's I have I here I have the package file. First, you can untar it and 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 extract the content uh, using this command. Okay, now you move into that directory called uvm underscore xmodel source a setup script of uh, which defines some of the environment variable used by this tutorial. And then we we'll move into the cadence directory and start the cadence virtue also. Okay, now once uh, this window, which is called command interpreter window uh, by Cadence, I want you to click this tools menu and select this library manager item on the top. This will open a library manager window, which lets you browse the design database uh, based on the designs library, cell, and view. Uh, before we start anything, uh, I would like you to take some time browsing through the contents of this xmodel underscore prims library, which contains the, the, the cells, uh, each of which correspond to the xmodel primitive. So here you see a lot of primitive cells available to you. And since they're, way, they're, they're a lot, uh, one better way to uh, browse them is to enable this show category options and click its category name one at a time. That way you can uh, browse through the primitives uh, that belong to the circuit primitive, connect primitive, domain translator primitive, function, logic gate, and so on. Okay, and for each of the primitive, let's say you'd like to learn more about what each of the primitive does, uh, you can select that cell, let's say filter, which is the most basic one for a uh, describing uh, functionality of a given analog circuits. Each primitive cell will contain this DOC view, the doc view, and when you double click on it, it will open a web browser describing what that primitive is and uh, what kind of input and output it has, and also what kinds of parameter it can take. So this is the handy way of learning each of the primitive in more detail. And I also want to point out that you can view the same documentation command line from the command line by typing the X model command. For example, you can give minus H, which will uh, give you this uh, online help in general. We can also give an argument, for example, as a uh, give a name of the primitive, then it will display uh, the same documentation text that you just saw from the previous web browser. Okay, so I went through this slide um, and the documentation, and here's another table uh, going through the different categories of the primitive. So uh, just to do it again, since you'll be working with some of them uh, shortly, function primitive describes the functionality of various analog mixed signal circuits. Circuit primitive represents the elements used in the analog circuits uh, uh, directly. And logic gates models the digital logic gate with the X-bit type input and output, which has infinite time resolution. 
Domain translated primitives are useful when describing some timing circuits uh, because it can convert between clock and one of its characteristics, our properties. Connect primitives uh, make, connects, uh, make connections between signals with different types. Stimuli primitive generates stimulus signals. And lastly, measurement primitive can take uh, various measurements on the waveforms. All right, so let's start with a simple example uh, to get familiar with this tool environment. Uh, first, I'd like you to open uh, a cell named EX1, which is part, which is one of the cells in AVM underscore lib, and you open it, it's one of its views called schematic. So uh, this notation says you're opening a cell view, that's what it's called, uh, under the library ABA underscore lib, cell name EX1, and a view name schematic. So if you go here, go to the library manager, select the library name. You can now turn off this show category option. Cell EX1 and view schematic. Okay, so on the schematic, what you see is two primitive already placed on the schematic. This one is called filter primitive. And right now it will serve as a fake dot, uh, which will be later replaced by the real uh, filter dot. And this one's called the dump primitive, which instructs the simulator to record all the waveforms uh, into a file. Now, in this uh, first exercise, I'd like you to place a primitive within this box, which can generate a sinusoidal signal uh, that gets fed into the input of this filter dot. And let me give you a hint, since it's your first time uh, uh, learning X model primitives. Your answer is one of these stimulus generator primitives. So here you have a DC gen primitive generating DC signal, EXP gen primitive for generating exponential signal, uh, sine gen primitive for sinusoidal signal, step gen for step, and a piecewise linear PWL gen primitive for expressing arbitrary waveform uh, described in a piecewise linear format. Okay. Answer is easy, uh, sign gen primitive, right? Um, okay. So we like to place a sign gen primitive within this box. And just in case you're new to Cadence Virtuoso, the basic steps of, of adding an instance to your schematic is you can select the create menu on the top, select this item called instance, or most of the commonly used uh, menus in Cadence Virtuoso has a shortcut key. So you can uh, also uh, add an instance by just pressing a key I. When you do that, this window will pop up and I can choose a library. Um, you can browse a library or type, type the name of, of the library directly. Uh, in our case, we want to place a primitive instance. So choose X model underscore prims. And our answer was sign gen. So place a sign gen primitive. And uh, well, for the view, we like to select symbol. When you do that, you see a various parameters showing up on the bottom. And uh, you can, for example, you can type in the frequency value that you like. Now, uh, when this is done, you click on the hide button on the bottom. And after that, you see that this yellow symbol shape is following your cursor. And you go to the place you want to drop the symbol and click once. That's it. Uh, this yellow symbol is still following your cursor in case you want to, you know, place more instances. Um, but we don't. So you press escape key to get out of that mode. All right. So here's one more important step. Every time you make changes to your schematic, 
and you want to run simulation with that, you have to click on this key called check and save. Uh, this will not only uh, save the contents into the disk, but also make sure that you have uh, made proper connections and it will make those connections effective. Okay. Let me give you one more uh, tips while we're at this. So let's say, for example, you okay, right now I, I set the frequency to, to 50 kilohertz, but let's say you want to change this frequency value to something else, let's say 100 kilohertz. Um, you can do that by selecting the symbol and do a right mouse button click and select properties item. Or you can just click, you can just press the key Q, which is a shortcut key for this menu. Then you now you'll see this uh, edit object property window popping up. And now you can uh, make some edits on the parameter values, for example, 100K. Okay. Uh, of course, whenever you make changes, don't forget to click on check and save. Okay, here's some more detailed description on the other primitives mm, that we saw on the on the you know this example one. Uh, for filter, this filter primitive models a general linear analog filter. And you can specify arbitrary filter characteristics using its gain, pole frequency, and zero frequency. For example, uh, in, 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 in our uh, example, uh, this filter primitive models a bandpass filter, which has two poles, one at 15 kilohertz and the other at 150 kilohertz. And you specify these frequency by using, by listing each of the uh, the the real part and imaginary part of each of the poles. Yeah. So this zero number is for the imaginary part of that pole frequency. This bandpass filter also has a zero, uh, in this case at a DC, which is a zero hertz. So that's why we have a two zeros here: one for the real part, the other for the imaginary part. And and. This will specify a bandpass filter with a pass band ranging from 15 kilohertz to 150 kilohertz. In other words, uh, this filter will pass through the signal whose frequency is between those two frequencies, but will start to will, will attenuate or suppress signals which has a frequency outside this range. We'll, you'll be able to confirm that uh, in a moment. The other primitive, uh, the dumb primitive, uh, like I said, instructs the simulator to record the simulated waveforms into a file. And currently the supported file, file format includes the JEZ format and the FSDB format. JEZ format is our proprietary format that plots the waveform using those events. So it's, it's a format that can demonstrate uh, that we're really, you know, triggering very few events during the simulation. But this one can only be, on, this one can be viewed only using our own waveform viewer called X-Wave. So to support, uh, people who want to keep using their own favorite waveform viewer, uh, we can also record our waveform in FSDB format, uh, which is a very popular format supported by many waveform viewers out there. All right, so with this model schematic, let's try to generate uh, the system variable netlist or the X model netlist from it. The basic procedure is to first open a X model test bench editor. Uh, we can go to the cluster menu and select this open test bench editor item, or, or you can also just click on this, uh, icon, which says open test bench editor. Okay. And in this example, we're just running simulation directly with this schematic model. Like the schematic, the schematic is basically our test bench because this sign gen is producing a signal, which is the input to our dot. And we have also these, uh, essentially, uh, uh instruction, uh, to record all the waveforms. 
right? So in this case, we can directly run simulation with the schematic view. Uh, and here on the, and on the simulation tab, you can choose one of the simulator you'd like to use. Uh, in our, uh, in our, in this recording, we'll use Excelio. And you can set the simulation time, time scale, uh, and, and uh, some extra options if you like to use them. Okay. Now to generate Netlist from the schematic, all you have to do is to click on this icon which says Generate Netlist. Then on the uh, command interpreter window, it says model has been successfully written to some directory. And you can view that Netlist by clicking this icon, uh, Display Netlist. And uh, it opens up a text editor uh, showing the contents of the Netlist. Here you can see that the signals on the waveform are being declared as an X real type because they're both analog. And we have two primitives, uh, one for the sign gen, the other for the filter. And we have this initial block uh, because we place the dump primitive on the schematic. So these two commands, xmodel underscore dump file and dump bars are the commands to tell the simulator to record the waveform into this file. Okay. Now that we have saw that uh, our signals are using some special data type called Xreal, uh, let me tell you what kind of signal types the Xmodel uses. Xmodel introduces two new data types. One is Xreal, the other is Xbit. And Xreal is for expressing the continuous time analog signals in the event-driven format. Basically, those format that uses a few number of events uh, to, to, to describe the analog waveform using the equation expression. Uh, the other type is Xbit, which, which, is, which represents a timing accurate digital signals. Again, uh, these are digital signals who transition times uh, the resolution of expressing the transition times are not limited by the time step of the system variable simulator. Um, as you, as you well know, time in system Verilog is quantized. Uh, in other words, time can only be a integer multiple of those unit time step or called time precision. But for some special logic gates that are the digital gates that I mentioned before, like the frequency phase detector of phase lock loop, uh, you really want, uh, you know, find much finer resolution in expressing their timing. And XBit has a capability of doing that. So, uh, for those timing sensitive signals, uh, you can use the XBit type. And, uh, when you compose this model schematic, some of the signal may be digital. Some others could be uh, analog. And X, uh, the glister has a capability of, of automatically detecting the type of each signal. Uh, so we'll declare the right type in the generated netlist. And in case you connect two signal with different types, it also knows how to insert connectors uh, that can uh, uh, convert the types so that they can chorus uh, with each other. All right, so let's now, uh, let's now try to run simulation, uh, with this, uh, system variable code. Basically, you can run simulation by clicking on this icon that says run simulation. And you can view the waveform, uh, by clicking this icon that says a plot waveform. Let's try to do that. Okay. So you can recognize that we're running Excelium simulation. And when it is done, you can click on the uh, plot waveform icon, which opens up this X-Wave waveform viewer by default. Mm, to plot the waveforms of the signal, uh, one way is to click on uh, the signals on the schematic and the X-Wave will open up the waveforms of each of the signals. Okay. And once you have this waveform viewer open with the signals, uh, you can use uh, various 
function. For example, we can select certain parts to zoom into a uh, so particular part of the waveform. You can select this panning mode to uh, browse through in the time through the time axis. You can also enable this cursor to take measurements at each time point. And you can also press this uh, zoom to fit I icon to uh, go back to the original zoom scale. Okay, so here what you have is uh, the sinusoidal signal that serve as the input to our filter, which is what we intended. So we are generating sinusoid uh, at the frequency that we set. And the second signal is the output of that filter. So maybe I zoom out a little bit. And, 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 and do it this way. You see that it takes a, some initial transient, but after a while, uh, the alpha sinusoid settles to a steady state response, which has a constant amplitude at a given frequency. Um, now that we have ran a simulation, another thing I want to mention is that uh, instead of using this X model test bench editor, which is a kind of a graphical user environment uh, interface, you can alternate, alternatively, you can also run the simulation on the command line. Um, so when you net list things out, it gets the, the, the net list is being generated within this directory. So, uh, another way of getting to that place is to change directory into x model underscore cinder, which is the environment variable containing the root path of the simulation directory. And then the library name, cell name, and a view name. Okay. So here uh, we see some of the files because we ran the simulation already. But I can clean it up by typing make clean. Okay, so let me do this. So what you see is a directory called models, which just contains one file in this case, uh, because it's very simple. And this is a file uh, that got netlisted, uh, that which we took a look at before. The sources.f file is a .f file. It has a list of models to be included, in, included for the simulation. And this make file uh, defines some of the targets like Run sim, which is a target for running the simulation, and plot wave, which is a target for opening up the waveform viewer. So the clicking these two icons, run simulation, plot waveform, is in fact equivalent to doing uh, running make run sim and make plot wave. For example, I can do this to run the simulation. So if you're a command line person, uh, you can type this make run sim on the command line, or if you like uh, playing with these graphical user in, in interface, that uh, you can run simulation from the X model test bench editor. And also another thing I like to mention is that uh, you may already notice that we are defining the simulation command using this X model command. This X model command is nothing but a wrapper script that provides you with the consistent interface uh, across the different system Verilog simulator. So I have a slide here. So it allows you to uh, write the simulation command, like specify the list of the source file, top level module, and also the simulation time. Uh, and can you can use this uh, set of option arguments for multiple simulators like uh, VCS, Excelium, and Cuesta. So if, if let's say your company have, has licenses to uh, you know, multiple simulators there, if you, 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 you run a simulation with Excelium, and if, if the license is in, in the shortest, you can just change the simulator name to run the same simulation with VCS. Um, so that's what the X model wrapper script is for. And what it is really doing is it's really launching Excelium or VCS or Questa simulation. And you can view the actual command being used by giving this dash dash command option uh, 
for example oops for example uh, let's say here's a here's a command for running some simulation with excelium and you can give a dash dash command option then it displays uh it displays the actual command that uh, the x model command will use to run the simulation so in this case it's using xm verilog uh, to first do the compilation and elaboration and using another xm verilog in the next step to run the simulation itself And if you switch the simulator name to VCS, uh, you can see that um, it's now using a different command, this time the VCS command to run, uh, to perform the elaboration and simv command uh, to run the simulation. All right. So hopefully this will give you an idea on what X model is. Um, it's really nothing but a add-on. Uh, basically, it has, when it runs a VCS or Excelium or Quest of Simulation, it uh, adds this .f file, which contains the list of XModel primitive. And uh, there's another thing, which is this SO file. It also links the simulation with the shared library, uh, which contains the definition of the DPIC function, which can be called from some of the X model primitives. So in some sense, so in this way, uh, running X model are fully compliant with the system Verilog. And, and, and it's not hard to believe that everything that runs on system Verilog can be run with X model. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think I ran the simulation with a different frequency, uh, but for each input with different frequency, you'll find that the output may have different amplitude response. So for example, at five kilohertz, uh, it has a 655 millivolt peak to peak. And I would like you to take some time and run this simulation multiple times uh, while changing the input frequency. And this way, you'll find out two things. First thing, uh, first, uh, you'll learn what a bandpass filter is. So bandpass filter will pass the input uh, within certain frequency range, but will, it will suppress the, the input at a frequency outside that range. So this particular filter dot that we have used uh, is it has a passband from 15 kilohertz to 150 kilohertz. Those are basically the, the two pole frequency we have set. Uh, so for 50 kilohertz, which, which is within that passband, can be passed almost as is. The input had a two volt peak to peak amplitude and the output is a 1.88 volt peak to peak. But when the input frequency is outside that frequency range, for example, at 5 kilohertz or maybe at 500 kilohertz, now the filter starts suppressing uh, uh, the amplitude. So instead of like uh, 1.88 close to 2 volt peak to peak amplitude, you're now seeing a much smaller amplitude like 655 or 595 millivolt peak to peak. So this is the first thing you, you will learn uh, from this exercise. Second thing is, you will probably find this process very tedious. Like you have to change the input frequency manually. You also have to, you know, measure the peak to peak amplitude either by eyeballing the waveform or by moving the weight, you know, cursors around. Uh, and, and which is another, uh, which is very tedious. And hopefully that serves as a good motivation for you to learn the rest of the, uh, rest of this tutorial. All right, so let's try to automate this process. And in lab exercise number two, uh, we like to build the instrumentation that take a real type input called F real and produce a sinusoidal signal having that frequency.
you know, having, you know, having F real value as its frequency. Okay. And in this example, I would like you to fill in these two boxes with a, with each with a primitive to uh, complete this instrumentation. Okay. First, I probably need to give you some better explanation on what I'm trying to do here. So on the left, F real, which is a real type signal taking the, having the uh, frequency value comes in. And first we use a real to X real primitive, which is one of our connector primitive to convert its type to X real, because that's the proper type, uh, you know, proper input type of, of most of our uh, primitives. Next, that signal, uh, is connect, it drives a integral modulo primitive. Uh, and we use this to produce a sawtooth wave that has the amplitude of one and a period of uh, inverse of F. Okay, how does it work? Well, this primitive basically performs a time integration of the input and uh, take a modular operation on the result before driving the final output. So when the F comes in as the input, it takes a integral of that, so you get a linear ramp with a slope of f. So when you when it starts from zero at time zero, it will reach at one at time equal to one over f. But beyond that point, uh, we there it also performs a modulo one operation, so the value wraps wraps down to zero and start again. So this is how it can generate a sawtooth waveform. In the next primitive, which you have to decide, uh, figure out, uh, we like to scale the magnitude of this sawtooth waveform by two pi. And, uh, and the resulting signal is basically a phase signal sweeping through a range from zero to two pi. Now with the second, what the, with the, with the primitive here in box B, uh, we like to take a sine function of that phase input so that we can now produce a sinusoidal signal with that frequency and the amplitude of one. Lastly, we'll use a polynomial function. In this case, this is describing a uh, first order equation uh, whose first order coefficient a can scale the amplitude and this offset uh, b, the zero order uh, coefficient b can set the offset, the center point of the sinusoid. Again, let me give you some hint here. Uh, you can find your answers in this list of uh, function primitives of X model. Here, the scale primitive does a scaling of the input. Power computes the input raised to the power of K. Deriv primitive computes the derivative uh, of the input. Here, uh, uh, PWL function computes the arbitrary nonlinear function uh, expressed in a piecewise linear form. And, and there are other uh, function primitive that can compute the absolute function of the input, sinusoidal function of the input, sine function of the input, exponential function, and a square root of function, uh, square root of function of the input. Have you figured out the answers? Great. Uh, for the first box, where we want to scale the input by a factor of two pi, we can use a scale primitive. And for the second box, we can use the sine function primitive. Let's do that together. Okay, so we're gonna, here's the library manager back again. Open EX2 schematic cell view and Here's the templates that we have prepared for you. At the first box, in the first box, uh, we want to place a scale primitive where the scale factor is two pi. And for the pi, uh, you can use this uh, constant name m underscore pi. Uh, this is a predefined math constant for the pi. Okay. And for the second box, I uh, can place sine funk primitive. 
And, and I can see that you can use either a sine function or a cosine function. It doesn't matter. Uh, we'll leave the rest as is. Good. And uh, don't forget to click on the check and save. And this last polynomial function primitive will scale the amplitude by 0.1. So the highest value will be plus 0.1. Uh, lowest value will be minus 0.1. So we'll have a peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of 0.2, and which is centered at this uh, offset point, which is 0.8. We choose this uh, bias point because in the end, it will be the proper bias point for the actual filter dot. Okay, so in this uh, in a schematic, this output, which is actually named in, uh, is fed into the input of our fake filter dot. All right, so now we are ready to run the simulation, except that um, to run a simulation on this model, we need one additional thing. Uh, it's mainly because this model, uh, though, at least this module, in requires the external input, which sets the frequency. So we need to have a top level, higher level test bench, which can feed in the frequency value into this input. So to do that, we have prepared a, uh, I'd like to introduce a X model test bench view, and we have already prepared an example for that. So when you open a test bench editor, select TB. So this is what we call X model test bench view. So in fact, uh, schematic is one of our test bench view as well but it's limited to the case where you run the simulation directly out of the schematic view. But when you define a test bench view, uh, you can also do some additional things. For example, on this design tab, you can add additional files. Uh, in this case is a top level test bench module, which will define F real value, instantiate your dot underneath, uh, and, and use this initial block to change FBL value from 5 kilohertz through the, uh, all the way up to 500 kilohertz over time. And, uh, we attach, we have attached, so test bench view allows me to attach this, uh, source code as part of the simulation. And here I specify the top level module to be the name of that, uh, top level module, the test bench module. Okay. Although we don't use this in this, in this tutorial with this test bench view, you can also customize the commands, uh, used for running the simulation or plotting the simulation results. In other words, you can change the command that gets executed when you press these keys. There's also another tab for running code simulation, uh, between, uh, Verilog and, and Spice. All right. So once everything is set up, uh, you can still run the simulation in the same way by clicking this run simulation icon and viewing the results uh, using the uh, plot waveform uh, icon. Okay. Now uh, start the waveform viewer. Okay. So uh, when I open the waveform viewer, uh, this time I'm gonna click on this uh, uh, button called Add Signals, which will open up this signal browser. And you can find the signal that you'd like to plot uh, by browsing through its hierarchy. So since we're now using a, a you know one upper level test bench, the signals that we'd like to see is within this uh, fixture module, which is the instance of the EX2 uh, module. So let's see if F real is changing as we want. And, uh, and it gets converted into a sawtooth, scaled to phase, converted to sine, and then, uh, you know, scaled and shifted to the input of the filter. And here's an output. So let me walk you through again. So first you see uh, the frequency value that changes over time. 
and in response to that frequency value, uh, the integ underscore mod primitive generates a sawtooth wave waveform with that frequency, uh, but the amplitude of one. After scaling it by two pi, now the value ranges between zero and two pi. And after the sine function, you get the sinusoidal function coming out. Uh, and it, now what you see is the frequency changing with the freak uh, f real value. And then after the polynomial function primitive, it's scaled to have the center point of 800 millivolt and the peak to peak amplitude of 200 millivolt. Now what you see is the response of the filter to that input sinusoid. And as you can see, as the frequency changes from 5 kilohertz all the way to 500 kilohertz, the amplitudes gradually goes up and then comes down. Uh, and this is probably an easier way to, to, to learn a, a bandpass filter, that when the frequency is within the pass band, uh, there's no attenuation of the signal. But if the frequency uh, is outside the pass band, uh, you, the signal does experience attenuation. All right, so let's move on. Uh, here's some brief description about the X model test bench view. Again, uh, it can define test bench settings, uh, such as the customized set of files and commands. And this is the waveform that we have uh, looked at already. Now, lab exercise number three. And in this exercise, we like to build the instrumentation that can measure the response of a dot. And for this particular example, I'd like you to place a proper primitives in these boxes that can measure the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the filter's input and output. To do that, I need to tell you a bit about uh, the measurement primitives of X model. So as I said before, uh, we have a lot of primitives that can measure, that can do automatic measurement on the analog signals. And this is mainly for writing automated test bench that measures some of the characteristics of your analog signals being simulated and do a check whether they are within the expected range. Uh, that way you don't have to eyeball waveforms or measure, do the, do the measurement on the waveform manually to make sure uh, those are correct. So our primitive primitives uh, in turn are classified into two subcategories. Uh, those that has a name starting with trig underscore and the other ones that start with the meds underscore. And in fact, you can combine these two types of measurement primitives uh, to describe a, a variety of measurements you can take on analog signals. So the trig primitives, uh, they generate trigger signal, which indicate a certain time instance of the event that you're looking for. Uh, for example, in this example, we use, let's say, trig pause edge primitive to generate an event tri trigger at the positive edge of the input digital signal, and use a trig rise primitive to generate an event trigger when the uh, input analog signal crosses a, a certain threshold in the rising direction. And then this meds delay primitive uh, measures the delay between these two time instances. Okay. So uh, for this lab exercise number three, uh, on that on those two boxes, you can place one of these primitive to measure the peak to peak amplitude. And the question is, which one? Here we have measure value primitive for taking the value at one particular point. Match average uh, computes the average of the input between these two time instants. Measure peak to peak measures the peak to peak amplitude, uh, peak to peak value of this input signal between uh, within the interval marked by these two time instants. Meds RMS measure the root mean square value, and measure delay measure the delay between the two time instances. Okay, answer is measure P to P. 
Okay, let's do that again. Uh, let's do that together. So you open ABM lib ex3 schematic view here. And we want to place a mes peak to peak primitive. Mes underscore pp. So um, this symbol takes an input from the left side and produces the output to the right side. And on our schematic, we want the input to face up uh, and 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 a output to face down. That means we have to rotate the symbol. And to do that, uh, you press the rotate button. Guess it's going in the opposite direction, so I press it twice more. And then it's in the right direction. Input facing top, output facing bottom. And this trigger input is on the left side. Okay. And I press once more to place another instance of the measure P2P. So this is it. Um, so this measure peak to peak primitive measure the peak to peak amplitude of the input and output sinusoid of this filter uh, block, a filter dot. And the measurement is being triggered by this trig rise primitive. So remember, this polynomial function will, will center the sinusoidal signal at 0.8 volt. And this trig rise primitive triggers the signal whenever that input sinusoid crosses that center point uh, in the rising direction. In other words, this trigger is being triggered uh, this trick signal is being triggered every period of the sinusoid. And uh, you might be you might find it curious that we are we are driving both the from input and to input of this uh, of this measure peak to peak primitive with this trig signal. By doing this, you're saying that I'm not taking this this measurement only once. I'm actually taking repeated measurements uh, every time there's a new every time. So I'm taking this peak-to-peak -peak measurement every period. In other words, every every period I will measure the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude and update my uh, output response, output uh, output signal, output value here. Okay. So uh, so since the from and to trick inputs are being triggered every period, uh, these measure primitive will update its peak-to-peak -peak output measurements every cycle every period of the imposonic sinusoid. All right, let's see that in action. So you check and save, open the test bench editor, select the TB view, the test bench view, and run the simulation. Okay, uh, you can now open the waveforms. So many of them will be uh, the same waveform that we saw before, like the F real input output. But now new waveforms are peak to peak amplitude of the input, peak to peak amplitude of the output. Okay. Right. So F real values are changing. Input sinusoids are being generated. And here is the response of the output sinusoid of the filter. Uh, whose amplitude are changing. And the first PPA output, uh, PPA in, measures the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of input. So after the first cycle, uh, it, it now has a valid uh, val uh, valid output, which is at 200 millivolt. And it stays there because the input amplitude is constant. For the PPA out signal, its value is changing over time because the amplitude of the output signal is changing over time. And uh, you may notice that, uh, as I said before, when the frequency changes from one value to another, the filter goes through some initial transient. So it takes some time to reach its steady state value. And so does the, the amplitude measurement uh, taken by this peak measure peak-to-peak -peak primitive. So this gives you some idea that 
uh, when the UVM test bench comes in, it has to wait for some time to make the proper measurement on the steady state value. And uh, what I just did here, maybe I, uh, I just enable the toggle markers indicate which indicates where the events are being triggered. You can do so by uh, clicking on this toggle marker menu item or just press M. And um, you can see that uh, for the sinusoid waveform that's changing its frequency, uh, even when it's very, very high frequency, uh, the number of events on the waveform is extremely low uh, compared to the equivalent case with the uh, other simulation methodology. All right, so that completes uh, lab exercise number three, where we now have now built another instrumentation for taking the measurements of the output signal. Okay, so now what we want to do is to model the filter. So, so far we use the fake dot and we want to replace it with a, the real dot. Uh, to talk about that, I'd like to briefly discuss on uh, two ways of modeling analog circuits. Largely, you can model analog circuits either in a signal flow model or in a conservative system model. Signal flow model is also called a block level model, where you describe your system as a network of blocks, each of which propagates signals in one direction, like from input to output. And this is what Verilog assumes, because like most digital gates, take an input and produce an output as a function of the input. But the conservative system model, uh, also we call them a uh, circuit level model, work differently. You know, uh, usually the signal doesn't propagate in one direction only. They can, they, the information can flow in both direction, forward and backward. And it's better to describe the system as a network of circuit elements where each node has a voltage, each branch has a current. And there is a, and, and these voltage and current must be solved simultaneously. You cannot determine that one by one. Um, so the way of doing that, you set up a circuit equation using the Kirchhoff current laws or voltage laws, uh, and also the terminal equations uh, governing the voltage and current of each of the devices. And then you solve that equation to determine these voltage and current uh, all at the same time. And this is what SPICE assumes uh, for analog circuits. And, and naturally, uh, we do see a lot of needs to have these circuit level models uh, in your system very low model um, because there, are, there are, are, are some certain behaviors or effects that can only be described by these circuit level models. Uh, some of that includes the switching behavior, nonlinear behavior, as well as the loading effects. Uh, among them, uh, the loading effects refers to the phenomenon that the characteristics of the circuit depends on what is connected to its output. And this kind of, you know, be phenomenon cannot be easily modeled with a sy signal flow model because what we're saying is the information, basically information flows backward, like from output to the driver. Uh, but when you use a circuit level model, the finite output impedance is connected to the finite input impedance of the next stages, which, which determine the overall RC time constants, which determines the bandwidth or gain or delay of the driving stage. Okay, so there is a lot of need to use the circuit level model in system very long, but most uh, well, Verilog cannot natively support it. But fortunately, with X model, you can use a circuit level model in a very natural way. So you have already seen that X model has this primitive called circuit primitives, which can directly represent the various device elements using analog circuits. So for circuits that contains these elements like capacitors and switches, it's possible for you to list them one by one 
directly as if you're writing Spice Netless in System Verilog format. And a nice thing is that this description runs entirely in System Verilog without Spice. And you can still have, you can still enjoy the fast speed uh, using the X model event driven algorithm. And with this uh, support uh, for the circuit level model, uh, this opens this opens the door to a way of auto extracting model from a given circuit. That is, if you have an analog circuit uh, that is uh, basically a collection of these uh, spice device elements, you can take each of them and convert convert it to a equivalent X model primitives. Then you can build a model just by connecting them up using the same topology with the original circuit. Like this, right? Uh, and this this is a very you know this is a flow that can be easily automated. And in fact, this is the first approach that our tool called ModelZen used to auto extract bottom up model from any analog circuits. When it converts each of the device element inside the circuit to the equivalent X model primitive, uh, ModelZen actually runs a small spice simulation to characterize its IV curve or CV curve. Meaning, uh, if, your, if your transistor or resistor has different characteristics depending on your process technology, models then will take those into account. And as I said, uh, the extracting model, once you extract a model from the circuit, uh, now you don't have to use a spice. Everything runs in system very long uh, without spice. So here's the snapshot. Uh, it's actually very convenient to use model Zen within the Glister environment because you can just run model Zen, uh, just click on the run, run model Zen icon, then uh, your schematic will be turned into an equivalent system variable model. Let's actually do that ourselves. So let me close some of these. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on in the AVM lib library, that's you know that's the library library we've been working with. Let's open this opm cell, uh, which contains a circuit for a two stage opm. You know, uh, you may not understand all the details of the circuit, uh, but you can just see that it's made of a transistors set of transistors like PMOS and MOS and maybe capacitor. And even though you don't understand the full details of the circuit, you can still generate model from this uh, circuit just by clicking or well, going to the Glister menu, selecting the item Run Model Zen, or clicking the same icon on the right. Did I click it? Okay. All right. Uh, as a first step, what it does is extracts spice or spectrum netlist from your schematic. And this is the netlist it has just extracted. And it is just asking for your confirmation to run. And from this window, you can see various options available for models and although we're not going to change any of that in this exam, in this tutorial. Okay, so click OK to let model Zen run. Then what it does is it has identified 10 unique devices with different parameter set. And for each of them, it's running uh, a spice or spectral simulation to characterize uh, their IV or CV curves. And once everything's done, we will build models, uh, whose, which is, gets, which gets imported back to this virtual design database as an X model view of that cell. So let's open that. Here you see the automatically generated model for this op amp circuit. And, uh, you can see that the, 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 the transistor or capacitor element you saw on the schematic 
are directly listed in our system variable code, while the parameters are stuffed by the model Zen, uh, which is extracted from the spy simulation. Okay. Yeah. So this this approach is what we call structural model generation. It's called structural models because you're not really trying to figure out the functionality. We're just create, creating the model with the same structure and rely on the fact that if you do the right thing, then the, the resulting model will always work correctly. This has some advantage, but the, but the disadvantage is that the complexity of the model that you generate is the same as the original circuit. Like it has the same number of transistor as in the circuit. So it, the, the speed that we can achieve is somewhat limited. Uh, it's only three or four times faster uh, than spy simulation. So to improve the speed of the simulation with this auto-extracted model, uh, we introduce a what's called user-defined model interface, uh, in short, UDM of model Zen. And this lets you select certain parts of the circuit and identify that as, oh, this is a voltage reference generator. This is an amplifier. This is an oscillator. This is a logic gate, and so on. And for those parts that have been identified, model then will try to model them as a, at, at, at the transistor level. Instead, it will characterize the part as the circuit that you just uh, identify and generate a higher abstraction model like the model that that will generate a voltage reference or just the, the, the model that will amplify the input signal uh, with using a simpler component in the model. And of course, the parameters controlling the characteristics like the output voltage value or the gain or bandwidth of the amplifier will get characterized through the spice simulation so they can, you can still achieve a very high accuracy uh, in the uh, simulation. So here's one example, which I'm going to use uh, using one of the components in this uh, bandpass filter example, which is a BPF underscore control. Okay. So to show how you, you can do the mapping uh, from scratch, let me delete this for now. And so what the circuit is, is it's a basically a, like a decoder logic that takes a set of external digital inputs and process them ooh, and process them to produce a, a set of digital signals that are used by the analog circuits in these uh, in this band pass filter example. And what we see here is a set of NAND gates and inverters, which is basically a combination of logic. So instead of telling models and to model these at the transistor level, you can select it. Well, first, you have to check and save, make sure that all the connectivity are up to date. And then you can select the part that correspond to the combinational logic. Sometimes it could be not the entire uh, uh, circuit, not the entire cell, it could be part of the cell. And then click on the right mouse button choose model Zen properties. And uh, it will open this window uh, on which you can make a selection to one of the UDM model that the circuit corresponds to. Here, I want to choose a COM logic UDM, which models a combination logic. Now, uh, once you make the selection of the, 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 the template model, uh, now you do a port mapping. That is, on the left-hand side, you see the actual net names uh, that crosses the uh, boundary of your selection. Some of them are inputs, some of them are outputs, some of them are power or ground. Um, so for each nets, uh, or you can call it a virtual port, uh, you tell models in whether those are input or output. So here, what you see is that control C1, control C2, R2, bypass are the inputs. So these are inputs. This is input. 
another input, an input. And it this logic produces the output signal that has some suffix uh, of, of underscore B or underscore double Bs. So these are all outputs. So one thing about U UDM is that for a given category of circuit, uh, it can support a flexible width of inputs and outputs. So this, in this case, uh, we're modeling a combination logic that has four inputs and eight outputs. And these two signals, VDD and VSS, are power and ground of this circuit. On the right-hand side, you see some of the parameters showing up, like the level is the, uh, the high value of this digital signal. Uh, this is required when you run a spy simulation using the circuit. For the high value, you want to give this voltage. And in the circuit, uh, the high value is 1.2. So I'm going to set all of them to 1.2. And the VDD of the circuit is, of course, 1.2. Okay. Um, this parameter is useful when your, your, let's say, a digital circuit has different input and output swing, uh, like those uh, level shifter circuits uh, or level converter circuits, uh, which can have a different VDD value for input and output. Okay. And after this, if you run models in, it will go through the same steps, but this time it will produce a different uh, model. Okay. So you can uh, check out the resulting model by clicking on the X model view of that cell BPF underscore core control. So the BP underscore control it ha contains the instance, which is defined right below, uh, which is essentially a Verilog RTL that describe output as a function of the input using this lookup table. Okay, so obviously this model will run much faster than, than the same model described in transistors. So at the top level, okay, so let's go to the bandpass filter, uh, cir the circuit that we like to model. So here's the top level view of the programmable bandpass filter circuit. So the basically the bandpass filter circuit is based on an op band. And at the input path, there is a series combination of the register and the capacitor. And the feedback path, there is a parallel combination of the register and capacitor. And this configuration is to have a bandpass characteristics. And the frequency that determines the starting frequency and the end frequency of the passband are set by the resistance or capacitance value uh, on these paths. And there are that are digitally adjustable uh, using these control, control signals, the digital control signals. Okay, and uh, those control signals are being generated by the control block, block that we have seen before. Uh, and some additional block will include reference generator uh, and an additional switch uh, that can bypass the input to the output when the bypass uh, control signal is high. So this, uh, and okay. And uh, one additional thing I want to mention is that uh, some of these capacitors, registers are enclosed in a, another block. And inside, um, to model a digitally adjustable capacitor or register, uh, you basically have a multiple set of capacitors whose connectivity can be uh, made or not or be broken uh, using a set of switches like this. Okay. And you may notice that, oh, we have mapped that to a UVM, for example, to a capacitor, which models this block as a digitally controllable capacitor. Okay, so these uh, letters are in gray because this cell is not being editable. So let me change that and do it again. 
Okay. So uh, the way we model this is we say, oh, this is a capacitor, essentially a capacitor between positive and negative input, but the capacitance value may change as a function of these digital mode bit, uh, which are the control signals coming from the digital block. Yep. And you'll find later that this block will be mapped to a simple capacitor whose capacitance will change as a function of the digital input rather than like these multiple devices at the transistor level. So again, we're using UDM to extract the higher uh, abstraction level. But with all that being done, you know, generating model from the circuit is extremely simple. You just go to this menu, run and run models in. Yeah, done. And you can review the results. Uh, here, here's the model that's just that is just generated. So at the top level, uh, here's the you know uh, module name bandpass filter programmable. And you may notice that it contains a set of sub modules. So in a sense that well, so it so the generated model preserves the hierarchy in the original design. And depending on whether we have used the UDM mapping or not, uh, some sub modules like the ones that I've seen before, the combination logic may have a, a simpler functional model. Like this capacitance has a lookup table mapping the digital input to the capacitance value. And here you have only three, ele three capacitance elements, like one between the positive and negative ports and the other the other is between each port and ground. Uh, like that's the paras parasitic capacitance. And you also find a similar, I guess a similar uh, model for the digitally adjustable register, but some other blocks like op-amp are modeled in, at the transistor level. So it's, it's possible to uh, combine both approaches. In fact, we do encourage the mixture of two. Uh, so you map the UDM to the parts that you understand very well and leave the rest as a structural model. No. And uh, like this reference generator is also another structural model. Okay. Now, so we got the model for our real bandpass filter circuit. So all we need to do is place this uh, model inside our fixture. Okay, so that fixture is prepared as a cell EX4. All right, yeah. So here you see uh, the, the parts you have seen before are this part, which takes the F real value in, produces a sinusoid, uh, okay? And this part will take the uh, measurement on the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the input and output. Now, I'm going to place the filter model that we just generated, which was under the library of ABM lib, cell of BPF, prog, and then the symbol view. Okay, we will just place it inside that box. Um, we have some additional uh, primitives on the schematic. Um, these are DC gen primitive. Each generate DC voltage for the VDD power and ground, and also the bias voltage required by the circuit. Um, this bandpass filter is has a has some digital programmability, like a, a way of choosing cutoff frequencies by changing the R and C values, and also there is like a bypass switch and so on. But for this tutorial, we're you, we're testing this you know, circuit at one fixed mode. So their control, voltage, uh, so control bits are being fixed at some value. And to do that in the schematic form, we're using a const underscore bit primitive, which just feeds the constant uh, digital value uh, to this signal. All right. 
Okay, so uh, after that, you just check and save. To run the simulation, open the test bench editor, select TB view, run the simulation. And after that's done, we're gonna plot the waveform and see if it works, okay? Maybe one thing you'll you notice is that, hey, after we now replace the fake dot uh, with the real dot, the simulation didn't become that, you know, didn't become slow much. Actually, it's about the simulation time seems to be about the same. Okay, so in the fixture, F real in put in output, PPA in and PPA out. And um, so you can see that the waveform looks almost the same. Uh, what's slightly different is this output waveform because now it's now coming out from the real dot. And still the number of events on the waveform is very low, maybe a little bit more um, than before, but still very few. Um, and 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 as, as we feed the uh, uh, stimulus and get the response at the output, the measurement is being made properly. Uh, one measuring the input peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, the other one measuring the output peak-to-peak -peak amplitude. Okay. Yeah. So let me close this part one um, by summarizing the fixture that we have built so far. Uh, I'm going to toss the source code format of the fixture uh, because, you know, in part two, we'll be running everything in the system Verilog source format. The fixture module uh, first has a uh, interface bus uh, for bringing the input and producing the output. And, and these interface buses make connection with the driver and monitor component of the UVM test batch. So this will be described in more detail by Charles in part two. And as we discussed, the fixture includes the model for the device under test, in our case, the band pass filter model. And we have generated this using model Zen. And to drive the input of that filter dot, uh, we have an instrumentation generating a sinusoidal signal from the frequency value. And then the second instrumentation we use was on the output side, which takes the measurement on the peak-to-peak -peak amplitudes of the input and output. This fixture module contains some additional uh, thing. Uh, for example, the set of DC gen primitives for the power and ground and bias. And uh, there is some okay, sequencing signals um, in order to uh, indicate the timing for feeding the next input and also uh, indicate the timing for the, the UVM test bench monitor to grab the results uh, from the fixture. So uh, the more detail will be described by the Charles by Charles in the part two, but basically the input, the te UVM test bench will feed an input called packet clock. And at the positive edge of that packet clock, the new F real value will be uh, given. And starting from the negative edge of the packet clock, uh, this fixture will start to measurement. In other words, uh, it will start looking at uh, the sinusoidal signal coming out of the filter. And every time that sinusoidal signal completes a period, uh, a signal called trig or tick will toggle. And, and since there, there is a finite period of transient, uh, before the output amplitude settles to the steady state value, we wait until five periods are completed. Uh, that's when the tick toggles uh, five times. Then uh, we will trigger the talk signal, and talk signal will tell the monitor component of the UVA test bench uh, to grab the peak-to-peak uh, -peak amplitude values uh, from the fixture. Okay. All right, so this is part three, and let me summarize what we have learned here. Uh, we learned how to build a fixture module, which is a key component of, of, of extending UVM to analog verification. And this fixture module contains two things. One is 
the AMS circuits under verification. And uh, we wanted, wanted to model this in system Verilog to keep everything within system Verilog. And the fixture module also include analog instrumentation, either for generating the stimuli or measuring the responses of the dot. And to do these, uh, first, to, to come up with the model for our, our circuit under test, we use model Zen to auto extract system very low models uh, from the circuit. And we learned how to put these primitives together in a glister environment, compose some of the analog instrumentation. So our fixture is ready. And the next step is to build the UVM components around it uh, to complete the UVM test bench. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention for just part one. And now I'll hand this to Charles for part two. Thank you.